So um, now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Gary Puckrin. Uh, Dr. Puckrin is president and uh, chief executive officer of the National Minority Quality Forum, a nonprofit organization located in Washington, D.C., that he founded in 1998. Uh, the forum addresses the critical need for strengthening national and local efforts to use evidence-based data-driven initiatives to guide programs um, to eliminate the di disproportionate burden of premature death and preventable illness for racial and ethnic minorities and other special populations. Dr. Puckrin also serves as the executive director of the Alliance of Minority Medical Associations, which was formed on the basis, on the basis of evidence-based data that highlight significant disparities in healthcare treatment plans and outcomes among many underserved populations within the United States. Dr. Puckrin was graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Brown University, where he received his master's degree and doctorate. Between 1974 and 1992, he taught and lectured at Roger Williams College, Brown University, Connecticut College, and um, Rutgers University, where he was a tenured member of the faculty. Dr. Puckrin has received many awards and honors, including being named a visiting scholar and fellow at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History and a visiting fellow at Princeton University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gary Puckrin. Good morning. Um, so uh, I, I got this call from Marjorie, and um, uh, she challenged me uh, to um, talk about uh, reimagining healthcare uh, and advancing uh, health equity through through data. So my organization, the National Minority Quality Forum, we are a research and education group based in Washington D.C. Uh, we've been collecting health data now for about 20 years. We have a database of over 5 billion patient records. We collect data on about um, 60, 160 million lives per year, covering well over 100,000 different conditions. Um, we see ourselves as an applied research group, and so we take that data and try to get down to the uh, community level um, to help physicians do guideline-directed care, uh, we have a faith-based alliance, and so we go into churches with the data and help them understand how to manage uh, diabetes and hemoglobin A1Cs and get people vaccinated. We have a barbershop alliance. We go into barbershops and beauty salons uh, uh, with the data. Uh, but Marjorie was really asking me something very different because um, this is a what we call a natural science group, and a lot of our work has been focused on really down at the community level, and so... Uh, it set me to thinking about, so how do I present health equity uh, to a group that's really in the natural sciences? And what it led me to um, was some work, uh, essay, uh, that um, um, Schrodinger wrote uh, in 1943. It was a public lecture in, in Ireland. Um, uh, Schrodinger was a physicist. He was one of the physicists who uh, formulated um, the, the wave function uh, for quantum mechanics. He was one of the original uh, developers of, of quantum mechanics. And uh, he did this um, lecture because um, he was trying to link chemistry um, and physics um, to look at um, genes uh, because he thought that uh, there was something in the cell uh, that was transferring hereditary information, and at the time, when he was writing the, um, that, uh, doing that public lecture, um, there was no um, understanding of uh, DNA, and, uh, et cetera, and so he was hypothesizing 
um, that there was something out there. Uh, and his, um, his lecture uh, um, uh, sort of stimulated research in biology, uh, and uh, uh, Watson and Crick, later on in the 1950s, found what um, uh, Schrodinger, Edwin Schrodinger, was, uh, was hypothesized. Uh, and his work um, gets reaffirmed, at least in my mind, uh, through the Human Genome Project, uh, CRISPR, uh, and now we're talking about multi-cancer early detection screening is using, um, using um, DNA. But deep in his, in, his, in his lecture, which actually ended up being published as a book, What is, uh, what is Life?, um, he talked about uh, the physical laws that govern living things. Uh, and um, basically, he had come to understand that the basic building block of everything were atoms. Um, atoms were the building blocks of planets. Uh, they were the building blocks of galaxies. They were the building blocks of the universe. But they were also the bu building blocks of living things. And so in thinking about that, what I realized is that living things, human beings, are emergent of these physical laws that we now call the theory of everything. So this is the standard model of physics uh, that uh, we now, that physicists now talk about as the theory of everything, that uh, when we look across the universe, galaxies, planets, living things, uh, they're all reliant upon the physical laws uh, that, uh, we, that, that are here in the standard model. And what I realized in looking at that and understanding those physical laws is that what we're really trying to do is get very, very smart about those physical laws because as we understand them, we get to control health outcomes. And part of what we think about at the National Minority Quality Forum is how do we control health outcomes? We don't want to get to 1950 and deal with diabetes. Uh, if you look at what's going on with multi-cancer early detection screenings, um, we're probably at the end stage of the war in cancer when you put that together with CRISPR. Uh, and so we see the future as a place where we are literally controlling health outcomes at the population level. Um, and so part of the work that you're doing is helping to transform us. But what is so interesting about this conversation about um, controlling everything and this is obviously DNA is all part of the, um, the work that Schrodinger was, was speculating on. Part of what we are realizing is that those physical laws guide us. They have to guide us because they're inviolate. <laughs> we can't do anything about them. They control exactly who we are. Uh, and you know, the historian in me realizes that um, Schrodinger op opened that conversation 80 years ago. But, you know, we had evolved a whole evolution a million years ago, um, and we developed this social identity and a way of thinking that did not include aligning with those physical laws. Uh, and I'm going to talk about race and ethnicity and what I call social identity, but those social identities that we've come together and, and sort of quarrel about have absolutely nothing to do with these physical laws of nature, uh, that uh, this is a whole new world uh, that is opening up for us that is going to transform who we are and what we think about because at the end of the day, our health is really going to be aligned or has to be aligned uh, with these physical, physical laws. So at the National Minority Quality Forum, when we talk about health care, what we're really talking about is mitigating patient risk. So going back to those physical laws, um, those laws of living things that keep our bodies functioning can fail. 
They can fail naturally through aging. Um, they can fail because we disrupt them. Um, and uh, we can think about illness and disease, um, uh, changing those physical laws. And so really what we have to do is think about how do we mitigate patient risk. There was a, a hearing near CERN, and I was thinking about um, there was a physicist who was at uh, CERN, Butterfield, and he wrote a book about uh, what was going on at CERN. And he's in the book, he's talking about his eight-year-old son, mind you, who was given an assignment by a teacher, and the assignment was, why do people take risks? Which I thought was an interesting question to put to an eight-year-old, but okay. <laughs> and, and his response was, they always have to take risks. You have no choice. You get up in the morning, you're taking a risk. You go to bed at night, you're taking a risk. We, are, we live in a world of risk. And so what healthcare is really about, at the end of the day, is risk mitigation. How do we control, essentially, our bodies um, so that we mitigate risk? And so healthcare, that's its purpose. Keep us out of the hospital, keep us out of the emergency room, keep us from disability, keep us from mortality while conserving high quality life. At the end of the day, that is the purpose of healthcare. Doesn't have another purpose. Uh, and, if, and when we think about adding another purpose, we actually undermine uh, what, what is healthcare. And so, what I also realized, and I, I would redo this particular slide here. So, it, you know, as I told you, National Minority Quality Forum, we're down at the community level and we're thinking about how do we mobilize community around health? And so we use this slide a lot to talk about evidence-based medicine and how everybody in, in the healthcare system and defining healthcare system in the broadest sense of the word, social services, policy, all of that. Um, we, uh, we, we showed this slide to help people understand that healthcare is really a, a deep collaboration. But looking back and reflecting on um, Schrodinger's work, what I realized is that really what we're talking about, insofar as healthcare is concerned, is the unification of science. At the end of the day, if we as a species are to survive, it is going to be, it's gonna come about because we've unified science around that issue. And that is the fundamental change of the 21st century. Uh, I, I was um, listening to the, um, uh, the lecture earlier and he was talking about humorism, the historian in me. So humorism comes out of the Roman Empire in the, uh, you know, when, when um, uh, and the idea was it was a complete unification of, of science. If you go read humorism, uh, it, it, it tells you why some people are smart and some people aren't, how disease happens. Um, uh, so it's a complete system of thought. Uh, it gets undermined in the 19th century uh, with the advance of, of clinical research um, because um, uh, humanism was sort of man-made speculations, didn't understand the physical laws, et cetera. And so we lost that unification of science at the point I'm getting to uh, because humanism uh, was a complete unification of science and it broke down in the 19th century. We are about to put that back together again uh, using those physical laws because they are the law, uh, and, they, and, and they're inviolate. We can't change them, but we can learn them, and they're, they're incredibly, um, uh, they, they allow us to do a lot of really wonderful things, and so I think that's, that's where we're going. So my point here is, this particular slide I would transform to really talk about the unification of science and how science has to come together uh, in order to do one very important thing, which is to keep us all alive. And I think that's really the purpose of, of that. So let's talk a little bit about um, inequities. Um, and this, again, is something that Marjorie's question um, um, caused me to think about. So one of the great problems in healthcare um, is what I call the, the demand problem. We have an unlimited demand for healthcare and small limited resources in actually to address uh, the needs of all of our population. And so 
And here I'm going to speak in the, in, in, from the framework of the United States, because I don't know exactly what's going on in the rest of the world, but I can tell you what's going on in the United States. The way in which we have dealt with this demand problem, this unlimited demand problem, is through rationing of care. And I'm putting the bet out there that most health care systems are rationing care uh, because they're all facing the same problem, which is this unlimited demand problem. And so when you come to talk about health equity, um, and understanding health equity now, I'm speaking about mitigating patient risk for all populations, you have to confront the demand problem. Because if you don't confront the demand problem, or at least the way we're confronting it right now, is we take certain populations. In the US, we use race and we use money um, to distinguish who has access to quality care. So all of that science that we're developing, all that capacity uh, that we're developing, um, uh, we, we're not able to translate it out to the, the total population uh, because of this demand problem. And so one of the things that we think about in the National Minority Quality Forum is that we have to reimagine health care. We have to reimagine how we think about health care uh, because um, the current system, we call it the legacy system, is really founded on inequities. Um, and inequities mean that we understand the physical laws that will address a particular disease, but we don't provide that care to everyone in the population uh, because we see it as a, as a demand problem. And so, so that brought me to and, and, and trying to understand from your perspective what role do you play uh, in this health equity, because you can easily say, we got nothing to do with that, right? <laughs> that we are doing a physical law thing and we're creating this standard language. And, uh, and so that really belongs over there in that social realm. And so why are you sort of bringing this business to our front door? Uh, and the only way I can begin to explain this to you is to look at the other domain. So we have the way I separate it for you. We have this physical domain uh, that is controlled by these physical laws of nature uh, that we cannot change. Um, they, they run on their own. Uh, we can learn about them. We can use them, but we can't change them. That's that domain. We have another domain that I would describe as the man-made social domain. And so this is a rough sketch of what healthcare looks like in the United States uh, because we do not have a national health insurance. Um, and so uh, this is the mess that uh, American healthcare looks like, which is basically all the money in the system comes from individual households. Some people get it uh, pay out uh, through the employment-based system. Some people um, uh, get uh, government insurance, either Medicare and Medicaid, uh, but even the Medicare and Medicaid program, um, more and more it's being mitigated uh, through um, commercial insurers. Those commercial insurers are typically uh, managed by venture capital, private equity uh, has moved in. So there's about $2 trillion lying on the table here, uh, which is very attractive. Uh, and so you get these, um, these investors in here and they sit between the patient and the provider. And the core idea of, of the way the system works, it goes back to that demand problem, right? We can't provide health care to everyone. Uh, we need to ration other care. And those plans and others um, uh, essentially do the rationing. Uh, they, they try to decide who gets what. And so it's not just who gets what how long you can get it, who can give it to you, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's how we provision health care. But what's important about this has nothing to do with those natural laws of physics. It has nothing to do with it. Um, when you go in and you look at, their, look at their models, it's all about financial risk management. It is not about how do we align with the physical laws of nature 
to accomplish the task of, of health care. And so in the equity movement in the United States, this is what we're confronted with and this is what we're trying to reimagine, uh, that this system, um, it produces inequities. Um, structurally, it produces inequities because it's a financial risk management system. And so for, for you folks, it means that the great work that you do gets mitigated by the system because it is uh, it's really not designed uh, to help you really accomplish the work that you, that you want to do. So the way we sort of break it down is we talk about patient risk against financial risk. So if your healthcare system subordinates patient risk to financial risk, particularly when you have a rationing sort of scheme about it, you are going to produce inequities, right? And so uh, part of the challenge for everyone uh, in healthcare is, I'm going back to that demand problem. Um, so how do, we, how do we address that demand problem? And, and, and that's, what we're, that's what we're about. Because when you actually get access to the data and you look at the data, you can actually see where the system is producing the inequities. Um, and you can see by the policies and the rules that are established why some populations end up with shorter life expectancies, go to the hospital more, not getting quality care uh, because the healthcare system is not aligned uh, with those physical laws that drive healthcare. So we talk about the paradigm shift. The paradigm shift is to move our healthcare system um, into an, a new realm where we have the ability, the latent ability, to control health outcomes. I mean, that has got to be our purpose at the end of the day. We don't want our children and their children to be dealing with these diseases that plague us right now when as we get smarter, we can take care of them. Uh, but the real fundamental challenge is how do we, how do we structure that? How do we put together a healthcare system that's really and truly aligned uh, with those physical laws? So when we look at it, what we see is if you look on the financial risk management side of the ledger, it's going to produce inequities because you're going to pick winners and losers because you're rationing. It, just, it is the nature of the system. Um, you're going to see the elevated hospitalization rates, mortality, et cetera. You're going to drive down innovation. If you spend two seconds in American healthcare, uh, you'll see uh, those who are managing financial risk decrying any innovation that comes into the marketplace uh, unless it costs nothing. And so they end up balancing, literally balancing the health outcomes against the financial costs. And if you always do the math, it's cheaper to let them die than it is to try to take care of them. And so um, there's a tendency to drive down innovation. On the other side, it also drives up costs because you're not learning. Um, you're not making the investments that you need to make in order to control it. Think about it. I mean, we, we essentially mastered hepatitis C, right? But in the United States, 14,000 people die every year from hepatitis C because we don't want to pay for the medications to give it to them. Um, you know, uh, I, I could go through a whole list of diseases like that where we have the capacity to change, but we're not. So on the other side of the ledger, where we're arguing for is really focusing on patient risk, aligning with those fundamental laws so that we drive down inequities, we reduce hospitalizations, and the other is it. We innovate. I was so glad to hear about the idea that medical knowledge is accelerating, and that's where we want it to go. But it's not just the acceleration of the knowledge itself. We got to get it to bedside. We got to get it to patients, um, and and that's what we're arguing for: is to really uh, take those innovations and make sure they get out to the community level. And then we want to drive down long-term costs 
uh, because we're getting smarter and we're curing as opposed to just um, offering palliative care. I'm going to do this quickly in, in, in time. Um, so I know one of the things that you guys have been working on is pharmacogenomics. Um, and the, the basic point here is that our healthcare system doesn't pay for pharmacogenomics. I mean, theoretically, if, if I was in charge, what I would say is we want to genotype every child at birth. The minute you're born, you should be genotyped because that's going to tell us your susceptibility to disease, how you metabolize medicines. Um, and so being able to genotype you uh, at birth will allow us to provide you the kind of care because at the end of the day, um, it's, it's those physical laws, it's those genes that are really driving um, your health outcomes. And so um, that's what we want to do. Um, so uh, I took a quick look at um, this is some work that was done on warfarin. Uh, warfarin um, is provided to patients who um, um, have um, atrial fibrillation and are likely to have a stroke. Um, and so um, uh, we put them on warfarin. Warfarin is a very difficult um, drug to use uh, because um, it has a narrow therapeutic range. Uh, and one of the things that we found out in the use of warfarin is that there, was, there were some gene alleles um, that were um, mitigating both the, the dose, how you dose warfarin, and how do you maintain the patient um, on warfarin. And one of the things that was seen is that there are variations in this allele. Um, and so um, what we saw was, you know, back there, what we saw was that um, um, African Americans um, had uh, an allele, um, it was, let me see, it's eight, I think it's eight, 11, 12, something like that. I can't remember the exact numbers. Um, and oh, yeah, five, six, eight uh, for African Americans. And for, um, and when I say they have it, uh, we're really talking about four or five percent of African Americans have it. Um, and when you look at uh, European populations, about 11 percent have the allele of the SIP two and three. And so what was happening is, um, the studies were trying to align social race, social identity with the gene data, right? To see if they could use phenotype to predict how you ought to dose warfarin. And they got confounding information uh, because it was not predictive because guess what? Phenotype is not predictive of genotype. And so um, what, what it said is that if we just use genotype, which goes back to the physical laws of nature, right, that, that social identity we created, but the, but the, the genes really come from, from the, um, the, the, the physical laws of nature, and we began to organize the research and study and provide it to uh, patients that way, I think we'd have gotten a lot better outcome. And so um, here we're just talking about how that literature, because they were trying to al align it with social identity, really gets confounded. But the long and the short of it is um, that we would say, look, let's, let's forget about social identity. Let's just look at the genes and see when we put that study together how, how well it would work. And so um, what ended up happening is that the government looked at all that confusing data and said that we cannot use genotype, genotyping, dosing uh, for the use of, of warfarin, and so they refused to pay for it. And so instead of us being able to properly manage people on warfarin uh, using their genomic type, um, we failed because we were trying to intersperse race. And so we get these really bad outcomes for African Americans. Um, they're 40% more likely uh, to have a stroke, uh, even though they're on warfarin. And, and it is not just um, warfarin, but the whole pharmacogenomic testing is not done, even when it is by the literature, by the science, shown that it will benefit the patient, but because payers don't want to pay for it, we don't genotype 
uh, patients. So what I say to you coders is that you have, a, 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 I think, a bit of a challenge. On one side, you absolutely have to use um, the science. You have to use those physical laws, those genotypes, et cetera, uh, in order to get best possible outcome. But I also think inside your code, you need to also play social identity in there. And the reason why um, I'm, I'm saying that to you um, is because that's how we'll know whether the system um, is equitable or not. It has nothing to do with the science. It has everything to do with the provisioning of healthcare to make sure that all populations are getting, because we still, uh, we still have this dualism about us. On one side, physical laws. On the other side, social identity. Uh, and so there's a place to keep social identity um, in mind as you do your, uh, as you do your coding. Um, so, I also think, and here you have to decide whether you want to get down in the muck in the world of advocacy, uh, because the work that you're doing won't get translated unless you advocate for it, unless you help people understand um, that there really are these physical laws of nature. Uh, we're helping to get them to bedside. Uh, by our coding, um, and um, uh, and you have to be part of that conversation about how do we deal with the demand problem and making sure uh, that we're really providing health care to everyone who comes through the front door, um, and we don't we don't fall into the rationing trap uh, because rationing is easy, you know, you just uh, and, and it's done very sophisticated, so populations don't even know uh, that they're being rationed. Uh, but at the end of the day, that's not quality health care, and that's not the equity uh, that we're trying to get. Um, so um, I want to thank Marjorie for opening this door for me, because it, it caused me to realize uh, that at the end of the day, there are these physical laws of nature that we are emergent from that essentially give us guidance and direction, and I would argue um, that our future is really in controlling health outcomes, and we can control them if we understand those physical laws. Thank you. I'm good. Questions? Um, I'm Lisbeth Sidiris from the Netherlands. Thank you for a very nice, uh, in intriguing presentation to start the conference. Uh, I work in primary care pediatrics with children, and more and more is a problem of health literacy, especially, as you mentioned, vaccination. The more people read and know about vaccination, Twitter or whatever, they are uh, vaccinating less instead of more. <laughs> also, how? Do, how do we prevent women drinking alcohol while we know the child will be disabled? So it's, uh, it's the question, how do we put all this knowledge, and I think, I'm sure coding, drawing coding will help, but how do we put all this knowledge in the community? Have, do you have any suggestions? You know, um, you know um, uh, you're living in the United States for the last five years, I've come to realize uh, that communications and the way we communicate uh, and share information um, is incredibly important. Uh, that um, uh, people are capable of believing just about anything. Uh, and, and so um, what's incumbent upon us who live in the world of science uh, and understand how science works is to be able to translate that back down to the community level. Because if we leave them behind, um, if we do all these smart things, um, but they can't ingest it, they can't use it, um, they can't, they, they don't have it at the moment that they need to make a decision, then essentially why have we done this? What, what, what is the point? And so um, 
it is, it is a deep challenge um, that we're going to have to learn a lot about. Um, you know, social media, for example, is essentially a new phenomenon. Um, and um, it, uh, right now, many people use it as a toy. I'm fascinated. My daughter does TikTok, and I don't understand what all that's about. Um, but, but the point is, they're sharing information. They're, they're creating a framework. Um, and, um, and quite bluntly, the adults are not at the table uh, to try to help them understand that um, um, you raise your risk when you do that. And people hate for you to talk about risk. You, know, you talk to people about risk, they get really upset. Uh, but at the end of the day, that, that's what it is. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but so much saying back to you that um, there is a fundamental need uh, for us to put science in the public domain um, and be able to take that uh, information and help people make very informed decisions about the, cause the, the, the laws of physical nature that I was talking about. They actually don't care what we think. We can think anything. They're going to operate and do what they do. So um, uh, our point is to help people understand that it's there and how to use it. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Pecklin for a very thoughtful and engaging uh, presentation. <clears throat>